dealt with throughout the ages. And leprosy disfigures its victims by destroying their ability to feel pain. So lepers begin losing parts of their bodies, not because of the disease itself, but because they're constantly injuring themselves due to the loss of the feeling of their limbs. Or in bad cases, things were coming and eating them, and they couldn't feel it at night. Now, the ancient world didn't understand the, 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 the deadening of the nervous system at that time, but what they did know that leprosy was highly contagious. And anyone who got leprosy was shunned. They were ostracized by being isolated from their family and their friends, never to have physical contact with them again, never to hug a child or feel the caress of their spouse. And when others came near them, leopards were mandated to yell out, unclean, unclean, because touching a leper was forbidden. Listen to this story by Max Lucado of how it might have felt to have been a leper. Five years ago, no one touched me. For five years, no one has touched me. No one, not one person, not my wife, not my child, not my friends. No one touched me. Oh, they saw me, they spoke to me, I sensed their love in their voices. I saw concern in their eyes, but I didn't feel their touch. There was no touch. Not once. No one touched me. What's common to you, I coveted. Handshakes, warm embraces, a tap on my shoulder to get my attention, a kiss on the lips to steal a heart. Such moments were taken from my world. No one touched me. No one would bump into me. What I would have given if someone would just bump into me. To be caught in the crowd for my shoulder to brush up against another's. But for five years, it has not happened. How could it? I was not allowed on the streets. Even the rabbis kept their distance from me. I was not permitted to go to the synagogue, my own church, not even welcome in my own house. I was untouchable. I was a leper. And no one touched me until today. One year during the harvest, my grip on the scythe seemed weak. The tips of my fingers numbed, first one finger, then another. And within a short time, I could grip the tool but scarcely feel it. By the end of the season, I felt nothing at all. The hand grasping the handle might as well have belonged to someone else. The feeling was gone, numb. I said nothing to my wife, but I know she suspected something. How could she not? I carried my hand against my body like a wounded bird. One afternoon, I plunged my hands into a basin of water intending to wash my face. The water reddened. My finger was bleeding, bleeding freely. I didn't even know it was wounded. How did I cut myself on a knife? Did my hand slice across a sharp edge of metal? It must have, but I didn't feel anything. It's on your clothes, too, my wife said softly. She was behind me. Before looking at her, I looked down at the crimson, crimson spots on my robe, and for the long, longest time, I just sat over the base and staring at my hand. Somehow, I knew my life was about to be forever altered. Shall I go with you to tell the priest, she asked. No, I sighed, I'll go alone. I turned and looked into her moist eyes. Standing next to her was our three-year-old daughter. Squatting down, I gazed into her face and I stroked her cheek, saying nothing. What could I say? I stood and looked again at my wife. She touched my shoulder, and with my good hand, I touched hers. 
it would be our final touch. Five years have passed, and no one has touched me since until today. The priest wouldn't touch me. He looked at my hand, now wrapped in a rag. He looked at my face, now shadowed in sorrow. I I never faulted him. I've never faulted him for what he said. He was only doing what he was instructed. He covered his mouth, extended his hand, palm forward. You are unclean, he told me. And with one pronouncement, I lost my family, my farm, my future, my friends. My wife met me at the city gates with a sack of clothing and bread and coins. She couldn't speak. By now, friends had gathered, and what I saw in their eyes was a precursor to what I've seen in every eye since. Fearful pity. As I stepped out, They stepped back. The horror of my disease was greater than their concern for my heart. So they and everyone else I have seen since stepped back. Oh, how I repulsed those who saw me. Five years of leprosy had left my hands gnarled. Tips of my fingers were missing as well as the portions of, of, of my nose and, and ears. At the sight of me, fathers grabbed their children. Mothers covered their faces. Children pointed and stared. And the rags of my around my body couldn't hide all of the sores, nor could the wrap on my face hide the rage in my eyes. I didn't even try to hide it. How many nights did I shake my crippled hand and fist at the silent sky? What did I do to deserve this? But never a reply. Some think I sinned. Some think my parents sinned. I don't know. All I know is that I grew so tired of it all, sleeping in the leper colony, smelling the stench. I grew so tired of the damnable hell I was required to wear, the bell also around my neck to warn people of my presence as if I needed it. One glance and the announcements began, unclean, unclean, unclean. Several weeks, weeks ago, I dared to walk the road to my village. I had no intent of entering. Heaven knows I only wanted to look again upon my fields, gaze again upon my home, and see, perchance, the face of my wife. I did not see her, but I, I did see some children playing in a pasture. I hid behind a tree and watched them scamper and run. Their faces were so joyful and their laughter so contagious that for a moment, for just a moment, I was no longer a leper. I was a farmer. I was a father. I was a man. Overcome and infused with all of their happiness, I stepped out from behind the tree and I straightened my back. I breathed deeply and then they saw me. And before I could retreat, they saw me and they screamed and they scattered. One lingered, though, behind the others. One paused and and looked at my direction. I don't know, I can't say for sure, but I think, I really think she was my daughter. I don't know, I really can't say for sure, but I think she was looking for her father. That is what made me take the step I took today. Of course it was reckless. Of course it was risky. But what did I have to lose? He calls himself God's son. Either he will hear my complaint and kill me or accept my demands and heal me. Those were my thoughts. So I came to him as a defiant man, moved not by faith but by desperate anger. God had wrought this calamity on my body and he would either fix it or end it. But then I saw him. 
And when I saw him, I was changed. You must remember, I'm a farmer, I'm not a poet. So I can't find the words to describe what I saw. All I can say is that the Judean mornings are sometimes so fresh and the sunrise is so glorious that to look at them is to forget the heat of the day before and the hurt times of past. When I looked at his face, I saw a Judean morning. Before he spoke, I know he cared. Somehow I know he hated this disease as much as, no, more than I hate it. And my rage melted into trust, and my anger became hope. From behind a rock, I, I watched him descend a hill. Throngs of people followed him. And I waited until he was only a few paces from me, and then I stepped out. Master. He stopped, and he looked in my direction, as did dozens of others. A flood of fear swept across the crowd. Arms flew in front of faces. Children ducked behind parents. Unclean, someone shouted. Again, I don't blame them. I was a huddled mass of death, but I scarcely heard them. I scarcely saw them. Their panic I'd seen a thousand times. His compassion, however... I had never beheld. Everyone stepped back except him. He stepped forward toward me. Five years ago, my wife stepped toward me. She was the last to do so. And now he did. I didn't move, I was frozen. I just spoke, Lord, you can heal me if you will. Had he healed me with the word, I would have been thrilled. Had he cured me with a prayer, I would have rejoiced. But he wasn't satisfied with just speaking to me. He drew near and he touched me. Five years ago, my wife touched me. No one has touched me since, until today. I will. His words were as tender as his touch. Be healed. Energy flooded through my body like water through a furrowed field in an instant, in a moment. I felt warmth where there had been numbness. I felt strength where there had been atrophy. My back straightened and my head lifted. Where I had been eye level with his belt, I stood now eye level with his face, his smiling face. He cupped his hands on my cheek and drew me so I could feel the warmth of his breath, and I could see the wetness of his eyes. Hey, don't tell anybody about this. But go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded for people who are made well. This will show the people what I have done. And so that's where I'm going now. I will show myself to the priest and embrace him. I will show myself to my wife. I'll embrace her. I'll pick up my daughter. And I'll embrace her. And I will never forget the one who dared touch me. He could have healed me with a word, but he wanted to do more than to heal me. He wanted to honor me, to validate me, to christen me. Imagine that, unworthy of the touch of mankind, but worthy of the touch of God. Wow. What a powerful and visceral portrayal of what it meant and felt to be a leper. How many of you felt the desperate loneliness of that man? 
How did you feel the guttural longing to reconnect with his family, with other humans? As much as this help us, helps us understand the leper, his encounter with Jesus tells, a lot, tells us a lot about God as well, namely two things. Number one, God loves to get his hands dirty. That's the character and the nature of God. We think he's holy, and he is. He's other than us and pure and sinless, but you know what? Our God is a dirty God because he loves to come down and get his hands dirty with us. Number two, nobody is untouchable to God. God loves to get his hands dirty, friends. The story I shared gives us the, the cultural context, which is absolutely necessary to understand why Jesus' interaction with lepers was so amazingly startling. And it was a potent demonstration to the length to which God will go to extend grace to people whom society believes are the least deserving of it. But then isn't that the definition of grace? And the way Jesus himself interacted with leprosy victims is a great illustration of God's compassion toward you and me. I mean, Jesus was a healer. But he wasn't just a healer. He was a healer who used his hands, his very hands, to catalyze his miracles. And we see Jesus doing this throughout the Gospels. At least five times in the book of Mark alone, he touches those whom he heals. And Jesus willingly, frequently, touched the men and women everyone else tried to avoid. Everyone else who said, you may not play with the kids in that family. You may not associate with them. He not only interacted with these rejected ones, but he reached out and he literally touched them. And he wanted and he was willing to be close to them. And my friends, that closeness was not a sign of a weak God who meddled with the undeserving, but of a strong God who could heal the sick and perform an even greater miracle, giving dignity back to the despised. Grace and God's power are friends, not enemies of one another. It's not a weak God who associates with weak people, but rather a strong God attracted to the opportunity to be powerful in their weakness. So grace doesn't show God's weakness, but rather his incredible strength. The Bible teaches us that God demonstrates his own love for us right? Romans 5, 8, in how he came to us in Jesus. He didn't expect us to climb Jacob's ladder in our own meritorious way in order to reach him. No, he climbed down to us. He got his hands dirty so that we could have our hearts cleansed. And a dirty God gives us a clue about his church and the world. You see, my friends, gospel culture is the exact opposite of cancel culture. Our culture has a general distaste for belief in a God who judges, and yet we can't stop ourselves from judging each other with increasing ferocity. Cardinal Francis George, who's the Archbishop of Chicago, said this, in the United States, everything is permitted, even encouraged. But while practically everything might be permitted, 
practically nothing is forgiven. By contrast, in the church, much is not permitted. But while much is not permitted, everything can be forgiven. Our culture pulls us toward vengeance. Our faith towards mercy. And vengeance keeps us at a distance, whereas mercy allows us to to move forward, closing the gap. And this is vitally important because nobody is untouchable to God. Let me restate this. Nobody is below or beyond God's touch. No one is so far gone or so worthy that God isn't willing and able to reach out and to touch them. Jesus' disciples, back to our story, they thought his interaction with lepers was reckless. I mean, even dangerous. Yet, almost as quickly as we're introduced to Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, we find him doing what? Running into a man with leprosy. I mean, his reaction was a showstopper. Jesus didn't run away. He didn't turn his head. He didn't try to avoid the diseased man. No doubt the man yelled unclean as he entered the city of Capernaum in a desperate effort to seek out the new rabbi who was rumored to have powers of healing even over leprosy. And when Jesus saw this man, he was filled with pity. Or compassion. Filled means just that. He was topped off. He was pouring out with compassion. He was spilling his love and tenderness out. He was moved, as some other translations have put it. And when Jesus saw this rejected, isolated, abused and very sick man, he was immediately moved from somewhere deep inside of him to care for this man. That was his first and immediate reaction. You and I would count the cost. We would do a quick CBA, right? Cost-benefit analysis in, my, in our minds. Should I or shouldn't I? What's this going to cost me? What's the p- potential? We've been doing it for a year and a half, right? Masks, no mask. Distance, no distance. Vaccination, no vaccine. See, we're all counting the cost. Jesus, he just went right at it. Went right at him. And most people were immediately repulsed. And, and, and they should be... And they were repulsed because they thought, oh my gosh, can you believe it? I had the unfortunate event of, event of running into a leper today. But Jesus was different. He immediately cared for the man. And then Jesus did something absolutely culturally absurd. He reached out his hand and he touched the man. And it was the touch of Jesus was all it took to yank this man out of his misery and to recreate and to rewrite this man's story. And within seconds, the leper's life's course was totally altered one more time. Because you see, my friends, when hopeless people in hopeless situations, come face to face with Jesus, things change. When hopeless people and hopeless situations are touched by the hand of God, things change. And the leper's life, we read, was changed forever. Because Jesus touched, I mean, it activated something inside that man. And it must have produced some massive biological fireworks display, right? I mean, can you imagine the, the chemical reaction as this man's predicament met the power of the creator? 
I mean, sparks are probably flying off his DNA in every little cell in his body, and, 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 and twisted things started to straighten out, and numb things were, were, were feeling again, and things that had disappeared might be regenerated, and life-infused death was being made beautiful again out of this man whose days had been numbered. It was the moment when this man heard the voice of his creator again and the miraculous stepped into the inevitable and it made a dying man dance. We've talked about canceling, ostracizing, cancel culture. But there is one kind of counseling, however, that Jesus was all about. And we read it in first, or excuse me, in Colossians 2, verse 14. It says, He forgave all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Maybe this was the reason why Jesus himself was canceled by his culture and ours. I mean, the scandal of his promiscuous love towards those who are hated, his amazing grace to those who are guilty, it's just too vulgar for a culture that has to find some solace in dealing with the uncomfortable log in their own eye by pointing out the speck in everybody else's eye. And that's the big difference between Jesus and cancel culture. While our, our culture, including some in the church, cancels people who have done terrible things, Jesus cancels the terrible things that people are canceled for. And the sins and the scandals that cancel culture chooses not to forget, Jesus chooses not to remember. Can you see how the gospel is now upside down world? And what Jesus does remember and never forgets is that he is a forgiver of sins, the friend of sinners, the brother of the outcast, the God of the 70 times 7 forgiveness, and he is the Lord of of redemption and reconciliation and of healing. Let's pray. Oh, may we see that Jesus. May we be touched by Jesus. Some of us have been keeping our arms out at length keeping Jesus away from us like he was the leper. Oh, when I get my act together, I'll come to Jesus. Oh, when I grow older and life's more important and after I've settled down having my fun, I'll come to Jesus. Oh, friends, let's not wait. He is willing and ready to come and touch you to alter your life's story and to give you the forgiveness and the healing and the peace and the fellowship that you've never, ever experienced before. So we come to you. Amen.